it'll be fine. Okay. Just speak because otherwise we'll just go to just the speak, rain. You know, speak um, loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. Can you do me one favor on, on the count of three? Just clap your hands because okay. it helps sync the audio. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. All right. One, two, three. All right. That'll work. And let's see, I had a couple of questions with all the other guys, but I think a lot of the people watching this will already kind of be familiar with who you are and, and with what, you know a little bit of what, what we're doing. But uh, yeah, let's skip to the, the more of the management questions. So can you tell us a little bit about um, Alameda? Like where are we? A little bit about maybe a little bit of the history. Alameda is a, a very interesting uh, little place in California because it's the terminal point originally for the Transcontinental Railroad. So it's just like this, this was it. You know, this is where things ended. And we're on an old naval base. And so this area, this point was perfect for both shipping, for both uh, 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 having uh, the uh, you know aircraft carriers and the destroyers and all this, but but Alameda Point. That, so originally, this island was primarily a naval base, and Ronald Reagan closed it down in the early '80s, and it's it's just sat kind of with nothing going on here, and in all that time. So this building is, uh, as you can see, it's very cathedral-like. It was built in 1944 as a dry goods storage facility. You know, the, the, a big part of Putting Admiral where we put it is was to also have a pub where we could tell that story to the customers, help brewers and distillers tell their stories to, to customers, um, give brewers and distillers a place to, to sell their products, um, their beer and their spirits. Um, so we, you know, we have this great symbiotic relationship where we we make the malt right over here and it goes out the back door and. Um, and then beer, we buy beer back and spirits uh, that come in the front door here and we turn around and sell that to the public and we, and we do it in a way where we can try to tell a story of why people should be thinking about where the malt comes from and where their barley and, and other grains are grown. And um, this, is, this is where all those dots get connected. With respect to our barley, and that is really the key uh, component I say that we have different here, uh, is unique. It's developed by UC Davis in, in uh, uh, UC, University of California at Davis. Now there's two primary growing regions in California. There's sort of the, the Central Valley and up through the Sacramento Valley, and then the Klamath Basin on the northern area on the border of, of, of Oregon and uh, California. What, what we use here, our Bud at 12, is actually has its parentage from the um, barley breeding program at uh, um, Oregon State University, from Pat Hayes in Oregon State. Uh, our um, uh, barley researcher, Lynn Gallagher, got um, uh, uh, the, some lines of the full pint that Pat Hayes had uh, um, developed up there, and he bred it with uh, basically, um, it was crossbred and, and for some disease resistance because in the, in the Sacramento Valley, in the Central Valley, the diseases we need resistance to are um, some viruses, such as yellow dwarf virus, and other fungi, such as striped rust. Just ideal characteristics were developed by Lynn Gallagher uh, in parentage that, like I said, it started with the full pine, ended with some uh, barley varieties uh, from Mexico, and uh, it produced the budded 12 barley that we use today. All of our uh, farmers, uh, for the barley, we either grow it uh, uh, no-till agriculture or certified organic. No-till is a very progressive, uh, ancient but progressive way of growing in that every time you plow and till the soil, the carbon reserves in the soil combine with the air to create carbon and oxygen, CO2, and it's released into the atmosphere. If you do not plow and till the soil, the entire microbiome, the complex of bacteria and fungi that's within the soil, keeps the carbon locked up, and you actually have healthier soil, uh, it's more diverse, and you can have fewer inputs for what you're growing. So no-till agriculture is not just produce a healthier crop, but its primary benefit in today's world, for us, we think, is carbon sequestration. Also, we floor malt. And that is a very ancient traditional process that again, because of the microbiome that it's going to create on the germinating barley, is going to have little contributions to flavor that are going to be teased out by the kiln later on in the process, such that floor malting absolutely has a flavor impact 
on your finished mall. The, the, the differences and the nuances are subtle, um, and we're still learning about what makes some of those things different, but uh, you know, there are, you know, people talk about and, and experience the, the you know, increased um, complexity and flavor and aroma uh, that can come from floor malted grain, and, and no matter what you're brewing, even if you're, you know, adding a lot of other things, a lot of a big hop charge and um, you know, different kinds of mixed culture fermentations and whatever, um, you know, this is still the foundation of beer. And, um, and all those other flavors sit atop that foundation and are to some degree or another dependent upon it. And, and so to me, even if the differences are subtle, um, they're, they're still there. Our uh, germination floors, um, we have uh, to, to help keep the malt cool, we have um, radiant cooled floors. So there's um, PEX tubing um, running through the uh, concrete and um, we can run glycol through that tubing and control the, uh, both the temperature of the glycol and also the amount, the uh, flow of the glycol through the floor to um, regulate the temperature. Um, so that allows us to uh, yeah, keep our keep our malt nice and cool without having to build a whole um, like walk-in cooler inside of here. So we're able to malt just in this open building and um, still keep the malt nice and cool. Yeah, the, the the thing with floor malting is it's it's so ingrained in 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 you know I know for both Ron and for me we we've, we've been brewing for a long time. We both got into brewing in the '90s and uh, and it's. At that time, there was we didn't have as much access to, to as many kinds of ingredients as we do today, and knowledge wasn't uh, flowing as, as freely as it does in today's modern world. And so, there was always kind of a, a mystique and an allure about uh, about floor malted uh, floor, floor malted malt. It's our malt turner. This is Tim's brewery. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's behind the camera. Say hi to everyone, Tim. And um, yeah, the malt turner is pretty straightforward. It's got these um, rubber paddles that uh, spin and mix up the grain. Um, it slides on some. Uh, it slides on some UHMW rails. And if anyone has an idea for um, making one of these things that'll drive itself or be battery powered, we're all ears. In our kilning procedure, we're allowed, we can get our malt to our consumers pretty quickly. And so we have a freshly kilned, and that's what a lot of uh, small maltsters can do. Uh, we don't store it for six months and more. We, out of the kiln, we make sure that it's sold within six months. It's the difference between freshly baked bread and no matter what the quality, and bread that's been sitting on a shelf wrapped up in a plastic bag for weeks or freshly roasted coffee compared to stale coffee. So that's the quality that we can get. For our kiln, we, um, we built you know, basically just a uh, big insulated box with a false bottom floor, nothing too special there. Um, and then it's a, a indirect fired um, natural gas burner. And um, we kind of designed the kiln um, to you know, be able to do full recirculation. Um, we can get to about 375 degrees um, inside of there. And um, so we can make, you know, our, you know, we don't have a roaster, so we make our full range of malts here in the kiln. Um, so everything from a, a, you know, distiller's malt and Pilsner style malts all the way to um, like a 100 level bond uh, kiln smith, it's a kiln caramel. Yes, it is challenging sometimes to, to try to convey some of what's some of the most subtle and, and, and sort of nuanced aspects of floor malted grain to people. Um, you know, we live in a and operate in a world where there's just so many different ways that people are, are adding flavor and developing flavor in their beers and their spirits. And, um, and you know, but especially in beer, there's so many different ingredients that are being used. And and so you know, I think sometimes uh, the, some of the more subtle things can kind of get lost in the shuffle. These are steep tanks. Um, they're each. Uh, 8,000 gallons, so um, most of the batches we do right now are eight ton batches of raw grain. Um, these tanks, you know, we kind of built them a little bit too big. They probably fit more like 12 tons. Um, but pretty soon, as I'll show you in a minute, um, we're gonna start doing uh, full 10 ton batches. And so these tanks will work fine for that. Um, one uh, improvement we've made recently 
is we've installed some more um, stainless hard piping between the tanks and our cold water tank. Um, and then we've automated the um, drain, CO2 exhaust, and aeration um, functions. So we still have to fill the tanks manually, um, but at least we've gotten rid of all of our hoses and then we can set a drain time in the middle of the night and um, you know really start to fine tune our um, steeping cycles and get it to work outside of our typical work schedule, which is open up a, uh, a lot of flexibility for us. I think it's really important to be enthusiastic about uh, you know, why we do this and, and what we get out of it. You know, and I think that's where it's, it's, it's helpful that Ron and I have been brewers for 20 plus years uh, ourselves because a lot of times we can have those conversations with brewers, young or old, um, and, and, and have those conversations from a place of, of knowing what it's like to be on the recipe development side and the production side of making a beer. I ran into a brewer on the street this week who bought some, they, some uh, freshly kilned uh, Feldblum, one of our malts, last week. And they, from, our, from my earlier conversations with them, they were uh, waiting for this fresh batch of Feldblum uh, to come out of the kiln. Like they scheduled their Maybach recipe around when we were going to have this malt ready because I got them really excited about this idea that, man, when it's fresh, it's, it's really delicious, the smell, the aroma. So I ran into them in the street. They, they made the beer the day after they picked the malt up. They picked the malt up the day after it came out of the kiln. And, uh, and they, you know, this brewer enthusiastically volunteered when I ran into him. He's like, man, the brew house smelled totally different. It was amazing. We, we really get it. Like, it, you know, and like, you know, to see that light bulb go on for people. Um, yeah, it can be hard in a, in a busy world of so much going on with so many ingredients and flavors and things you can do and, and, and work with and choose. It's, it, it can be hard to kind of, to fight for like just something like subtle malt character, um, but uh, it's possible to, to get people excited about it. One very exciting um, piece of news at the malt house is that this whole um, storage area with all of the racks um, will soon be a third germination floor. Um, so we'll have our two eight ton germination floors and then this will be um, a little bit bigger. It'll fit 10 tons of, uh, 10 tons of raw grain. Um, and then we'll still just use our same kiln. And so by adding a third floor, um, we should be able to stagger the batches, you know, by 30 hours or so and just um, run the kiln back to back to back three times in a row. And then it'll be off for a day or two. And then we'll put the next three batches in. So um, yeah, using our same steep tanks and kiln, we'll really be able to increase our throughput and annual capacity, which is, very exciting. Um, also exciting is that we won't be handling uh, any, well, most of our grain we won't have to handle in super sacks anymore. Um, so we have a, a few new silos being installed outside and a um, chain and disc system up there in the ceiling to uh, deliver all of the raw grain into the steep tanks. So each of these silos will store just over a truckload of grain. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be a heck of a lot easier than unloading um, you know, one pallet at a time. Nothing is better than knowing your farmers and working with them because if you can know who your farmers are and if you can work with them, you can help solve problems on yield. You can help them have, uh, have better uh, practices even in their harvest so there's not so many skinned and broken kernels on how they store it. Um, it, there's nothing better than knowing your farmer and working closely with your farmer and knowing your local university and working with your agricultural university so that you can have that feedback loop between farmer and maltster and university to help create just a, a, a very unique um, and not perfectly bred but the most ideally bred varieties you can have to grow in your region is collaboration. I think this is, as, this is as exciting to me. What's going on right now with Craft Malt and what, and what we're doing and what everybody else is doing in the Craft Malt universe um, is as exciting to me as when I first got into brewing 25, almost 30 years ago. Uh, I see the same um, camaraderie, the same kind of, um, you know, just everybody on a mission trying to, trying to do a cool thing and, and, and change the way people think about something that they, they use every day in their beers and their spirits. Um, I, I think it's, 
it's challenging because we all have to sell our malt at a, at a higher price point than a lot of malts. And so, you know, in these days especially, that's not an easy sell. Um, but uh, it seems like, it feels like every week, every month that we do this, there's a little more enthusiasm out there, a little more understanding uh, for what we're trying to do and what makes it special. And, um, and, and our sales sort of reflect that, uh, even in the pandemic. And so um, I think it's, it's, it's hard work, but uh, it's, it's just so satisfying. And it just feels like we're all on the, on the right path together, doing a, a really special thing that's, that's gonna change the way uh, beer and spirits are thought of in this country. Um, yeah, so thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us on a virtual tour. Um, you know, when, when it's safe to travel again, uh, we'd love to have anyone and everyone come visit here. Um, yeah, we really miss showing people around in person and, um, you know, having a beer together, um, talking shop. We'd love to hear from other maltsters and, uh, yeah, love to also share, share our place with all of you. So hopefully we can see you soon. Cheers. Good B-roll for you. It is. This is actually for my personal stash. <laughs> this is for your personal. This just goes. This is just for me, Josh. Cool. Really cool. Really happy about this.